a vice president, a member of the cabinet, a member of Congress who is a member of the president's party. He should always consider that he is dispensable and should do what the man wants. Propaganda Series, Part 3. How to Destroy a Country with Your Bare Hands. We've said what we said, now let's use what we've learned. We're going to do a little role playing to show how the things we've talked about can work in different ways and just how dangerous they can be. Let's say that you like a certain boy or girl, but things have gone south. You've sent them two messages on social media and they've seen them but haven't answered. This is an unforgivable sin. But what they don't know is that you're on my notification squad and nobody messes with my subscribers. I agree to take action. You say great, F him. I say no, F the entire country for raising people so rude. Let's just end the whole damn thing. This is more than you had in mind, but whatever, we shake on it. Now, there is one problem here. This is an entire modern first world nation with hundreds of millions of people, a trillion dollar economy, and a military with nuclear weapons. And we're a couple of sociopaths who might have a plastic knife in a drawer in the kitchen. But that's actually not a problem, because we have some knowledge of the human mind, a complete lack of empathy for other people, a crappy old iPhone, the ability to lie convincingly, a bad minton set, and an extreme amount of risk tolerance. The first and most important is the knowledge, because we have no chance of doing this unless we understand a key weakness in every modern human society talking. You see, people aren't actually meant to talk. We're meant to grunt and point and watch each other and then decide on our own who we follow based on what we see. Talking allowed people to tell each other what to do without showing that it works. People have tried to warn us about this, but luckily no one listened to these fools. And every modern society has one ruler. Call them president, dictator, king, it won't matter. That system means that we can break down that entire nation by corrupting one mind. And that's where our plan starts. Stage one, deception. Now, one does not simply walk into a ruler's home and start telling them a bunch of crap. We have to do it the right way. This means using some social engineering. You see, in a situation where it's impossible to get through a door, a lot of the time, you can just walk right into the neighbor's yard and hop the fence. Similarly, while we can't talk straight to the ruler, we can get to their helpers. And if we impress them, they'll bring us right to them. This is how Joan of Arc got to meet the King of France. But she was able to predict the results of battles. And we're not so lucky. So instead, we'll use our crappy phone. We look up the addresses of every assistant or cabinet member who has access to the ruler and email them a prediction about some upcoming elections. Half of those will be dead wrong but the other half will be right. We send another prediction to that half, and so on down until we have one or two advisors left that have a list of perfect predictions. Now, the creepiness of our phone is key. We want the emails unsecured so they go to the spam folder and get ignored. We'll approach the advisor that's left and have him check his spam folder himself and see our magical ability. If this won't work, there's other scams we can use, but let's assume it does. We're now introduced to the ruler as people who have some incredible political knowledge and we have important things to tell him. But we do not want any reward or any title. We're just humble townsfolk who want to help. This will make sure that the ruler doesn't see us as having any agenda and the current advisors are not threatened by us. That humility, combined with the fact that we're so different from what they expect, will make our words carry more weight than anyone else. Now, our next order of business is to convince the ruler to change the government. But we'll do this slowly and carefully. We'll protect the ruler's ego at all times. A just question, my liege. We'll appeal to the need for the ruler to have greater control over the country. And we will use indirect argument. Whenever there's a debate, it will be between us while the ruler simply listens and the side we want will win every time. Eventually, since we're the most humble and the most flattering, the ruler will have us around the most, which means they'll be surrounded by our point of view. And just like anyone else, 
Their mind will start to gradually align with what the people around them think. In this way, if we're patient, we can install whatever political plan we want in their head. Now, which one should it be? Whatever you hate the most. If you take any one of them far enough, they can create hell on earth. And that's exactly where we're headed. Stage two, decay. At this point, you might think we hit a brick wall. Mr. President, I don't believe that's on your agenda today. Because unless our good-natured head of state is a dictator, there are checks on their power, which will stop them from changing the government. But you see, the laws of man are actually just instructions on a piece of paper. Sometimes it's a really old and impressive looking piece of paper, but that's still all it is. Its only power is what it makes people do. And if you can convince those people to do something different, the paper means nothing. And our newly convinced ruler can break down the belief in that paper the same way. After all, it's out of date, needs just a few tweaks. And the atmospheric peer pressure the ruler can create will cause enough support to gradually dismantle it. Eventually, the country is forced under a system that does not work. This means that people will start starving or wasting away. The ones who are hit the worst will be the first to leave the fog of BS, because staying in it is now a bigger threat to them than speaking out. And others, seeing the results of the bad policies, will not defend them. And so, the propaganda starts to melt away. But, the ruler will not see this, because they are dining on our bullshit. We keep them in a social bubble, with sweets, foot rubs, parties, and especially, bad men. We attach their minds to winning at these games, mastering the athleticism and subtle skill of the racket and birdie, instead of the health of their people. And the people's unrest will grow and be met only by the police until the breaking point. Stage three, chaos. The anger of the people becomes an all out attack on the ruler's home and everything in the country that represents the government including the armed forces that kept them down. Fortunately for us, we made an excuse to get the hell out of town before this happened, and we will simply lay low and watch the results. If the people are armed, they might win the revolution and start a new country, and our job's done. But if they're unarmed, it's a whole different kettle of fish. The revolution will be crushed, and then we'll take action. We will go out and record as much violence as we can until we have footage of a soldier killing a woman, child, or old person. And we will send this footage to the international media. Now again, the creepiness of our phone is key, because the low quality of the video will make it impossible to check the story we attach to it. A made-up story that will focus on emotional impact, the plight of a single sympathetic person being hurt, instead of the real numbers. And while many news outlets won't run our obvious piece of crap clickbait propaganda, one of them probably will. And the others will then report what they're reporting. And we get the same result. Press Secretary condemned the attack as reprehensible, saying it, quote, cannot be ignored by the civilized world. And this will activate the final stage of our plan, plunging this country into a war that can have only one result. Stage four, annihilation. Other military powers make an ultimatum to our ruler, but it is not possible for the ruler to follow it because we have tied their entire reputation to the plan they are now executing. Abandoning it would lose so much status that it would be the same as death. So they are forced to ignore the threat and continue what they're doing, even as their own generals abandon them. And likewise, the countries that made the threat are now forced to preserve their reputation and follow through no matter what or who they end up destroying. This probably sounds crazy, but this is exactly what caused the Cuban Missile Crisis and every humanitarian war in history. Dictators do not surrender. So all negotiations fail. And eventually, warnings are issued to everyone in the country, whoever can leaves, and hopefully those that can't find a fallout shelter, which is where we are when the bombs fall. And after the smoke clears, when it's all gone, and the foreign armies liberate the country, we come right out with the other survivors. They check our backgrounds and find out exactly who we are. Nobody. We take a boat to our new home, and when the coast is clear, we write a book about our experiences. 
getting rich and living happily ever after until someone else ignores our messages. As unlikely as it might seem, every part of this story has happened in history. And hopefully it shows that wars of weapons come from wars of ideas and understanding them is key to fighting them. Thanks for watching. I know this was a little experimental, so let me know what you thought about it. And if you didn't get the message, subscribe and click the bell. Bye.